Hey, what's up everybody, Brandon here, back with another quick tip. So if you watched my last video on my mix template, you'll know that I run all of my mixes through a limiter before I send them to a client. But what I didn't do is go into my limiter settings. That's what I wanna do in today's video. So if you wanna learn more about why I use a limiter before I send the mix to a client, go ahead and watch this video right here. If you're already up to speed, let's dive in. So here's the mix session for a beat that I've been working on. You can see down below, we have my stems being routed to my subgroups, which are then routed to my mix bus. Now this is the mix with no limiter. And now you can see down here, I have the mix printed with a limiter on it. Now you may notice that this file is called ceiling 0.0. .0. And if I switch playlists, I have another file called ceiling negative 1.0. So it might seem counterintuitive, but I want to discuss with you why I prefer to use a negative 1 dB ceiling on my limiters rather than going full loudness 0.0. .0. So first things first, let's go ahead and have a listen to the mix so far. So you can see, you know, if we scroll through the session, we're not really doing much. You know, I, I made the beat. Um, so I did most of the mixing actually in Ableton. This is just kind of cleaning things up and making them shine. But what I really want to get into is the limiter setting. So this mix was printed through Ozone, right? It's a beat. I wanted it to sound as best as it can. I kind of just slapped the mastering assistant on there and just let it do its thing. Um, but you can see if we open that up, that the ceiling is 0.0, .0 and true peak. So true peak, it's going to oversample and it's going to make sure that it's catching anything that's going above zero. So theoretically, there shouldn't be any peaks, right? That is true for this specific file, which is at 44.1, 24-bit. Now, if this was going to be released, let's say I'm going to put together an instrumental album or something, um, and you know, submit this to Spotify, Tidal, Apple Music you're not going to be listening to a 44.1 24-bit file. So what's going to happen is either you, the mastering engineer, or in some cases, you know, the streaming service itself, they're going to convert your full, you know, high-res file of 44.1.24 down to a 44.1 16-bit MP3. You know, this is this is known as lossy conversion, right? The resolution, your actual waveform has to change because the dynamic resolution is changing. Whereas before you had 24 steps to encode your audio, now you have 16, you're losing 8 bits. And because of that, errors are bound to happen. Now, what do I mean by errors, right? So wh where are these errors happening? Let's go ahead and have a look. I've already printed this mix with a ceiling of 0.0. .0. And I want you to pay attention to this track right here. So above, this is the 16-bit wave. This is not the file you'll be hearing on Spotify, Tidal, Apple Music, any streaming platform. This is the file you'll be hearing, the 0.0, .0 MP3. Now let's go to the loudest section, just so you can see exactly why I don't trust a ceiling of 0.0. .0. So you can see the MP3 is actually peaking while the wave is not. So why would that be happening? They're both copies of the same mix and both of them had true peak limiting on at zero. So, so theoretically, nothing is happening above zero. So here's where I have to get nerdy. So here we have a simplified look at what your computer is trying to do. You can view this as a very simple version of sample rate and bit depth. So from left to right, each one of these blocks is a sample. Each one of these is a little snapshot in time. And then from top to bottom is how much energy is being put, how much, how much actual information is there at this point in time. So the computer, when you're recording audio, says there's no information. Okay, there's a little bit. There's one bit of information. Okay, it's getting louder. There's two bits of information higher than that. And it keeps going, and it just tries to accurately trace this analog waveform. So the digital side is trying to approximate the analog input. Now in reverse, let's say we've recorded something already and we want to play it back. So the computer is going to read 
this digital information, the red, and send it to an analog speaker, which is then going to try and approximate that in the analog domain and produce the blue waveform. So let's go ahead and pretend that this line right here is zero dB. Now, on the digital side, you're not going to see any clipping. True peak, right? So it stopped any information. Even though there's information here on the analog side, it stopped it from being read above zero. It's just gonna write the zero there and call it a day. But when we go ahead and try and play this back on an analog device, you can see that there is energy happening above zero. So this waveform that I've drawn is only eight bits high for demonstration purposes. But, you know, just for comparison, if I was to try and draw this in four bit, it would look more like this. Right? It's gonna get way more blocky. And the analog representation would also extend further up in order to come back down and hit all of these points. Again, this is super, um, this is, I'm drawing this with like a trackball mouse, but it, you can get the picture. So essentially this is what's happening to our audio, right? We start with a high res digital representation of the audio that gets converted from 24 bit to 16 bit where the analog side has to overcompensate for missing information in the digital file. But let's set the threshold one dB higher. Right, so I could just, I could redraw this whole thing and bring it down, but visually it's the same thing as bringing the threshold up. So now my ceiling here is at negative one, right? It's not at zero, it's at negative one. And you can see I've created the headroom that the file needs to be accurately represented in both domains. I can see that it's accurately written in the digital domain. And when it leaves the computer and hits my speakers, it has the room, right? to still write the waveform without squaring out at zero. And just to prove my point, I'll go ahead and bring in the files that I printed at negative one. And let's go to the same exact location. And you'll see that the zero one is clipping. Meanwhile, the negative one is not. So this is why a lot of digital streaming platforms actually have their ceiling set at negative one. They're protecting themselves against intersample peaking. But this also goes beyond just sending your stuff to, you know, digital streaming platforms. I've also only sent my clients things that are limited at a negative one ceiling. The other day, someone sent me a mix and I listened to the MP3 because it downloaded faster on my phone. I didn't really think anything of it, but I heard distortion and I know this mixer. I, they would never let a, a file distort like this. And I listened to the wave and I didn't hear the distortion. And so I, I, I asked them, you know, what's your ceiling at? And they were like, oh, negative, you know, 0 0.1, just the 0.1. Even that, even though they had the true sample peak on, after the conversion process, there was audible distortion on the file. You really don't want to open any doors or any, any opportunities for someone to say, this doesn't sound right. And if the solution is as simple as dropping your ceiling to negative one instead of zero, I think there's no reason not to. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Stay tuned for more quick tips.